So uh, today our presenters, uh, and for the first time we have two presenters today, are Doug Howell and Daniel Lawson. Uh, in addition to the first uh, webinar with two presenters, this is also the first time we've had an out-of-house presenter. So uh, Daniel, we appreciate you being with us. Uh, Doug is our migratory game bird coordinator in our game and fur bear program and wildlife management division. And Daniel, as you can see, is a wildlife biologist now with NRCS, formerly a graduate research assistant in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. Uh, so this is uh, one of our cooperative projects between our agency and one of our university partners. So today, Doug and Daniel are going to talk about uh, the distribution and abundance, nesting ecology, and population genetic structure of American black ducks in coastal North Carolina. Again, thanks for being here, uh, especially Doug and Daniel. And with that, Doug, I'll let you take it. All right, appreciate it, David, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and as David mentioned, to discuss uh, the current status of American black ducks in coastal North Carolina. Uh, I'm going to start by just going over some some more WRC's done uh, over, say, the last eight years uh, to quantify the distribution and abundance of our breeding black ducks. And then I'll turn it over to Daniel uh, to discuss his work on black duck nesting ecology in North Carolina and population gen genetic structure, which was, as David mentioned, part of his graduate research work at the University of Delaware. So for those of you that might not be familiar with the American black duck, uh, it belongs taxonomically to a genus of dabbling ducks, which includes species, for example, uh, like mallards, uh, teal, pintails, gadwall, uh, and widgeon, uh, to name a few. Uh, the duck is aptly named uh, for its very dark body, which appears from a distance uh, black. Uh, genetically, it's most closely related to mallards. Uh, and while it's the largest of the dabbling duck species in terms of body mass, it, it is most similar in size to mallards. So in terms of appearance, uh, other than the bill color, uh, males have yellow bills. Uh, if you can see those ducks at the bottom right, uh, hens would have olive drab bills. So other than the bill color, uh, the species appear identical uh, from a distance. So in terms of distribution, uh, the American black duck is found only in eastern North America. In terms of its northern portions of its breeding range, uh, black ducks are only found there during the winter, excuse me, during the breeding season as snow and ice accumulation in the winter forces those birds to fly south. In the southern portion of its range, black ducks are only found during the fall and winter. And in the central portion of its range, black, black ducks both breed and overwinter here. Uh, and, and of note, uh, notice that uh, black ducks, uh, the southern terminus of the black duck breeding range is coastal North Carolina. So, you know, beginning in the early 1900s, you know, wetlands across the black ducks breeding range were being drained and converted to agriculture. Uh, so since about the 1950s, uh, this core breeding range has actually contracted and shifted to the east. So currently black ducks now are most numerous within salt and brackish marshes along the Atlantic seaboard. And also during this time, we've observed significant population declines. Actually, prior to 1950, black ducks were, were the most numerous breeding duck species in the Atlantic Flyway, but by the 1980s, we've seen declines, uh, as you can see there on the left, of upwards of 50%. Uh, and while the population has stabilized, it's certainly well below population goals set for the Atlantic Flyway uh, by the North American Waterfowl Management Plan and the Atlantic Coast Joint Venture. In fact, uh, black ducks are, are listed as species of greatest conservation need in 14 of 17 Atlantic Flyway States wildlife action plans, including WRCs. So, you know, black ducks are actually a flagship species and considered an indicator of the health of Atlantic Coast salt marshes. Now, in terms of those declines we, we've observed, you know, certainly, as I mentioned, uh, some of that's related to losses in the quality, quantity and quality of 
its uh, breeding and overwintering habitats. Certainly over harvest has played a role, particularly uh, prior to the time when uh, more restrictive harvest regulations were implemented. And then general interactions with mallards, specifically uh, competition with mallards for available habitat and then hybridization between mallards and black ducks. And, and Daniel's going to touch a, a good bit more on this as we transition over in his part of the presentation. All right, uh, you know, in North Carolina, you know, prior to 2013, WRC had never uh, implemented uh, a quantitative survey to assess the distribution and abundance of these breeding birds in coastal North Carolina. Uh, we did suspect that our breeding black ducks experienced declining trends similar to those observed in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, so really to begin to address some of this uh, shortcoming, uh, myself and Joe Fuller in the Migratory Game pro Program at the time uh, began to develop a breeding population survey for North Carolina coastal marshes. And our objectives uh, were specifically to quantify abundance uh, in terms of numbers of breeding pairs and total breeding black ducks in, in North Carolina. Uh, we wanted to understand how these breeding ducks actually distributed themselves uh, along the coast and certainly we wanted to identify any breeding hot spots which would really be an index of, of habitat quality. So in terms of uh, our survey, uh, we actually uh, identified uh, potential black duck nesting habitat from a land cover database specific to North Carolina. Uh, Potential nesting habitat consisted of three subclassifications of Atlantic coast tidal salt and brackish marsh. So in the map on the left and in red, you can see how that potential nesting habitat is distributed across North Carolina. And I'll give you just a, just a minute to absorb that. Okay. Uh, so we actually based our survey design on the Atlantic Flyway Breeding Waterfowl Plot Survey, where plots were defined as one square kilometer in size. So we overlaid a one square kilometer grid over uh, our potential habitat, uh, and then we extracted over 4,000 unique one square kilometer sampling plots. So uh, obviously we, we couldn't in any way, shape or form, you know, survey over 4,000 plots annually. So uh, we decided to take a subsample of those 4,160 plots and sample 130 plots per year. Uh, this allowed us to complete the survey in, you know, around three days, depending on the weather, and it kept cost, you know, at some reasonable level, in, in our opinion. Uh, so what we what we derive from, from surveying these plots, uh, what we do is take a mean uh, of all the plots we surveyed, uh, I mean, uh, the numbers of breeding pairs and, and the mean total numbers of breeding black ducks per one square kilometer plot. And then in order to, you know, extrapolate that to the entire survey area, we just multiplied each of those means by 4,160, which represented the total number of sampling plots. And that gave us total numbers of breeding pairs and total numbers of breeding black ducks in coastal North Carolina. So our survey was a helicopter based survey uh, conducted in early April to coincide with peak black duck nesting activity. Uh, we, we chose a helicopter for, for several reasons. First, you know, a helicopter can cover a lot of area in a short amount of time. Getting some feedback there. Uh, helicopters are able to fly low and slow, and, and that's important because it enabled us to use the noise from the aircraft and the rotor wash to actually flush black ducks from the marsh. So what we did is we just uploaded our the locations of our sampling plots into the aircraft's navigation system. Then we made three transects over each of those one square kilometer plot. And you can see that represented there in the map on the upper right. Uh, we flew at an altitude of anywhere from 10 to 50 feet above the marsh to try to get these birds to flush for, for us. And, and then we traveled for fairly slowly for an aircraft at a speed of about 35 miles an hour. So I've got a video here. Uh, I hope it's not too blurry. Uh, Teams doesn't like bandwidth too much or, or low bandwidth, but I'm gonna give it a shot. But essentially what I'm gonna do is put you the, in the observer seat there in one of our surveys. And if you, 
to get a laser pointer here. If you focus your attention to this part of the sky, you hopefully can see a couple of birds flushing. So with that said, we'll go ahead and play the video. Okay, hopefully that <clears throat> wasn't too pixelated, but I'll go ahead and move on. Uh, you know, in terms of what we observed during these surveys when we flush these birds, we, we have to make some assumptions. Uh, as I mentioned previously, you know, from a distance, you can't tell a drake from a hen. So when we observe, you know, individual birds or, or numbers of birds, then we have to somehow assign those to uh, a number numbers of pairs and numbers of total breeding black ducks. So, for example, uh, if we observe one single bird, we assume that bird was paired uh, and the hen or the drake may be off feeding somewhere else or attending the nest or, or maybe we just didn't see it. But uh, a single bird was assigned as a pair and uh, that would, would be two total birds. Uh, Two birds seen together was also a pair and two indicated birds. Uh, we saw three birds together. Uh, that was an indicated pair. We, we assumed the other bird was a lone male and similar to how we assign pairs to a single bird, we uh, assumed that was a pair as well. So that would indicate two pairs and four total birds. Uh, four birds seen together two indicated pairs, four total birds, and then a group of five or more birds. We, we consider those floaters and not migrants. Uh, we, we thought they were, we assumed those were, were breeding birds or potentially breeding birds. They just hadn't paired up. So none of those five birds were assigned to pairs. We just used that for our total indicated bird calculation. And that would be five total birds. Okay, um, after completing the 2014 and 2015 survey, it became clear to us that we probably didn't need to survey south of a line around Cedar Island, and then not west of a line uh, of the Pungo River. So none, none of this was surveyed. Uh, what we did see, uh, and you can see the distribution of our uh, observations here over uh, the 2014 through 2021 surveys. Uh, once you get north of Roanoke Island up to the state line, we saw very low densities of breeding black ducks. And again, south of Pea Island, uh, and proceeding down to the core sound had low densities of breeding black ducks. Where we did see a lot of ducks was here around Cedar Island, north along the Pamlico Sound through Hyde and Dare counties, up to about Mans Harbor, east and south down to Pea Island. So, so these are the habitats, this area here we think are the highest quality breeding habitats in the state for black ducks. Okay, results. Uh, survey results in terms of abundance. Uh, you know, on average between 2016, uh, when our survey became operational in 2021, we observed 1,000 breeding pairs and approximately 2,400 total black ducks. And, and we did make one interesting observation uh, during this time period. Uh, in 2017 and again in 2020, we had two extreme weather events that dumped upwards of 20 inches of water in the marsh and flooded those marshes. And, and what we observed uh, in, in the following year survey, we saw a decline in the number of breeding pairs in, in both cases. So that told us that, that likely uh, those extreme weather events uh, resulted in lower productivity the following year, but we'll follow that as we continue to do these surveys over time. Okay, comparative results uh, to, to other areas in the flyway. Uh, these are 2021 plot surveys conducted in Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina. Uh, Total number of pairs is in the top row and total breeding black ducks in the bottom row. Uh, while we can't actually compare North Carolina to Maryland or Virginia due to some differences in survey methodology, you can see that results for North Carolina are pretty well on par with Maryland. Uh, but the take home point here, I want to discuss Virginia just for a minute. Uh, 
over, I'd say the last eight to 10 years, for Virginia's pot surveys show a, a significant declining trend in their numbers of black ducks. And, and Virginia biologists attribute that to the islands, these black ducks nest on in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, they were once fairly large, but over time they've eroded and evidently they've found some threshold level where black ducks don't find those attractive anymore. So the point here is that Virginia's trend, declining trend continues then our breeding black ducks here in North Carolina are, are going to become more disjunct from uh, breeding areas farther north. And kind of wrap up my part of the presentation. Uh, you know, WRC now has an operational breeding black duck survey, and, and it does provide us a baseline for abundance and distribution in coastal North Carolina. And, and that's important because, you know, when I came in, we, we didn't have that. So we had to start from scratch. So Hopefully someone that comes behind us, you know, 15, 20 years from now can, can look back and now they, they've got a baseline to, to do any further analysis that they feel free to do. Uh, we do believe fluctuations in abundance that we observed on our surveys likely reflect annual changes in productivity of, of nesting black ducks. But, but however, you know, these surveys alone won't tell us what the causative factors are that drive these changes in productivity. So to address this in 2017, uh, as we mentioned previously, WRC contracted with the University of Delaware and partnered with the University of Texas El Paso to initiate some targeted research on North Carolina's coastal breeding black ducks. So with that said, uh, I'm going to hold any questions to the end, but I'll transition uh, over to Daniel's part of the presentation. Daniel, let me quit sharing and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Doug. Um, so I'm Daniel Lawson, and I'm going to be presenting my master's research at the University of Delaware under the advisement of Dr. Chris Williams uh, and in collaboration with uh, Wildlife Resources Commission, North Carolina, and, and additionally, uh, Dr. Phil Lavretsky from the University of Texas, El Paso. So the topic of my research uh, was nesting ecology and population genomics of American black ducks in coastal North Carolina. So building on some of the objectives that uh, North Carolina Wildlife Resources had, uh, you know, for the breeding population of American black ducks, you know, there was a few that uh, us at the University of Delaware kind of added in to get a full picture of, you know, the nesting ecology of, of these ducks in North Carolina. Uh, so foremost, uh, one of my object objectives was to determine nest initiation and peak nesting dates. Uh, and this was to provide uh, marsh burning timing guidelines because uh, generally um, WRC and uh, additionally U.S. Fish and Wildlife conduct um, early growing season burns, uh, which kind of coincide with uh, when black ducks are nesting. So we wanted to make sure that you know they were they were doing these when it, and not uh, you know not going to burn up a bunch of black duck nests <laughs> while they're doing it. Um, so secondly. Um, I wanted, we wanted to determine nest success estimates and model causes of failure. We also wanted to quantify nesting habitat preference, assess the genetic integrity and population structure of North Carolina breeding black ducks. And since there are, you know, uh, mallards that, that do overlap in range with black ducks in North Carolina, and they do readily hybridize. Uh, we wanted to determine if, if gene flow was occurring from mallards uh, to the black duck genome. Finally, we wanted to determine uh, sibship. This is just uh, identifying siblings and parentage. This is identifying adults of North Carolina nesting black ducks. So my study encompassed um, Hyde and Dare County uh, of coastal North Carolina, kind of centered around the Pamlico Sound and on the inner banks, uh, we looked at you know the, the marshes on the inner banks and then around to the outer banks. So a pretty large area that we covered. And this was you know following uh, WRC suggestions um, you know of, of where there are breeding black ducks potentially. So the management applications from the nesting ecology portion of my research, uh, we wanted to improve local population goals, and we hope that this research will, will do that. Additionally, like I mentioned earlier, we wanted to prioritize uh, when uh, professionals were doing marsh burning for scrap fire, um, and that was you know just just to make sure that we're not burning up a bunch of black duck nests. And then finally, we wanted to kind of quantify where these ducks were breeding on the landscape. 
um, and to determine, you know, how sea level rise might affect you know, that, that availability in the future. So I, I devoted an, an entire chapter to modeling sea level rise and changes in marshes, um, you know, over a hundred years. Um, so that's, you can find that in my thesis, but this, it will not be a portion of uh, this presentation today. So uh, our nest searches, they occurred in marshes that uh, WRC identified as suitable habitat. And you know they they did this through the, uh, the the helicopter survey where they were seeing pairs at. So we conducted uh, nest searches on our study sites from 20 uh, in the spring and summer of 2017 and 2018. The way we did this, uh, we modified the ATV nest drags, which this is um, you know two ATVs that have a chain strung between them. Uh, they really use these on use this methodology uh, in the in the prairie pothole region to to find uh, duck nests, uh, but we couldn't you know readily uh, drive four wheelers in the in the marshes, so we had to kind of do this on foot. So we modified it. Um, so instead of a chain, we had a rope with uh, cans and um, you know rocks inside of those cans to serve as noisemakers that we we drug across the top of the vegetation. Um, hopefully to you know get a, a, a black duck to jump off the nest then we'd go identify the nest uh, once we got to the nest you know we took we took metrics and and recorded the status if, if the nest was you know active um, and then we came back and monitored on seven day intervals until the nest either hatched or failed uh, so at each visit you know we recorded you know whether some of the outcomes would have been predated hatched flood flooded or undisturbed and progressing as normal on a subset of our samples, we actually were able to put trail cameras on the nest. And, you know, we did these on on nests that, you know, really had the vegetation to conceal the camera because we didn't want to tip off any predators or even humans that, you know, there was an active nest there. Uh, and we got, you know, we got some really good natural history info. And additionally, uh, we were able to identify a bunch of, uh, you know, the nest predators of black ducks. So at the completion of the nest, um, to kind of get an idea of what type of habitat they were nesting in, uh, we measured relative ground cover, and you know, this is pretty much just composed of, uh, you know, percent grass, percent uh, bare ground, percent water, um, you know, just kind of get an idea of, of where they chose to nest. Additionally, we measured uh, max vegetation height. Um, and finally, visual obstruction readings. This is pretty much uh, a combination of height and density of the vegetation. Um, and you know, we, we really wanted to pick out these these small, subtle changes, and you know, where they chose to nest versus sites that they did not nest in. Uh, yeah. So nest initiation and peak nesting dates. Uh, this was a big question we wanted to answer for two reasons. Uh, uh, like I mentioned several times now, we wanted to make sure that managers conducting prescribed burns, you know, stayed out of peak nesting season. And, you know, we additionally we wanted to make sure that the timing of uh, WRC's helicopter survey was occurring around the peak of, a ne of nest initiation. So nest initiation is when, you know, the nest is starting and the hen has not started actually incubating. So during this time, you'll see, um, you know, you'll see the hen more frequently off the nest. Um, and this is really the perfect time to conduct uh, these surveys because you get, you know, you get the male and the female oftentimes, um, you know, when you're doing the survey. Uh, so we quantified these, you know, by the, 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 the by backdating. Um, so whenever, you know, the nest fail, failed or hatched, um, you know, we, we recorded obviously what, what level or what stage the incubation was at. Um, so there's, it takes about 26 days for a uh, black duck egg to hatch that's been incubated. Uh, so we took that number 26 and then added that to, um, you know, however many eggs were in the nest because they lay about one egg a day. Uh, and that would give us, you know, we would subtract that number from, you know, the, the current day and that would give us, uh, you know, when the nest was actually initiated. Additionally, we wanted to quantify nest success and causes of failure. Uh, so in other black duck nesting studies in the mid and north Atlantic, uh, they suggested that predation was the, was the leading cause of failure. Um, and, you know, in, in, in marsh environments, you know, another concern was, you know, flooding. Um, and 
for comparison in in the chesapeake um, this this failure rate from flooding ranges from four to 38 percent um, and you know we wanted to compare that with north carolina to see kind of how we stand so i developed and tested a series of uh, 25 models in the program mc estimate uh, black duck nest success as a function of 19 variables some of these variables included uh, nesting vegetation structure nest initiation date age of nest when found general location of the nest so whether it was on an island or whether it was in the mainland marsh uh, year and then there were a few others that we tested as well so to really get at the question you know what what differences um, you know are black ducks looking at in, in selecting a, an area to nest so what what makes that site that they choose different from every other site in you know in the marsh so to do this, we compared uh, use sites, which was where the nest was located, to non-use sites. Um, so we took random points within 50 meters of the nest, and we compared those with the uh, nest metrics uh, using a t-test. Uh, so some other factors we looked at were the wetlands classifications um, and elevation. And in addition, our nesting met our nest habitat metrics were visual obstruction readings. As I mentioned, that was density, vegetation density. Uh, max vegetation height, and then your ground cover relative percentage. We really wanted to look at grass composition. Um, you know, we pulled that out of, of our relative percentages to, to look at that because we thought that that would be a big driver. So the results, um, we found uh, 140 black duck nests, uh, six mallard, six gadwall, and we found that they nested in um, really high marsh. It could be classified as high marsh. Uh, which was composed of a mosaic of black needle rush, salt metal cord grass, smooth cord grass, and salt grass. Um, so really, and, and you can see in the picture here on the right, um, you know, this is a mosaic. There's several species represented here, and so e even the vegetation is kind of uh, in a mosaic compared to what you see in the back here. You know, this is just short form uh, Spartana, which is low, not very much variation there. And then behind that, uh, that's black needle rush you know both of these kind of form a monoculture but in the areas where they all come together you know you, you have this nice mosaic and that's really what we found was uh, you know key to predicting where a black duck would nest uh, so these are where we identified black duck nests and this you know this holds pretty true to where we were searching for them you know we weren't able to actually go down uh, you know to cedar island um, or you know even pamlico point but we were really focusing on, uh, you know, the mainland marshes of Hyde County and additionally on the outer banks of Dare County. So for our nesting chronology, and this is, um, you know, where we determined our, our nest initiation dates, our peak was around April 16th. Um, and then our peak nesting date, this is when all the nests were kind of active, uh, was April 26th. So something interesting to note here, um, you know, in in 2017 we had a, a really big flood in the marshes, um, you know, and you can <laughs> clearly see the dip here, um, and that was that was caused by failures due to flooding, um, and you see this you know large effort um, after the fact of renesting hens. So different from from the second year, we didn't have any you know flooding events. So you have this normal bell shaped curve that we would have expected. Uh, so nest success, um, you know, for comparison's sake, the Mid Atlantic, um, their black duck nest success ranges from 31 to 55 percent, and then the North Atlantic states and Canada, they're around you know 21 to 42 percent. We found that, uh, you know, over two years of the study, we had uh, an average of 54.5% nest success. So that's over half of the nests initiated actually hatch. Um, that, that translates to our daily survival estimates of 97%. And, uh, you know, we, this is the output from uh, uh, the MC estimate where we tested our models. Um, so what we can gather from this is that uh, there was a, a, a positive correlation with uh, nest success on natural islands, meaning that there was higher nest success on natural islands, higher nest success on spoil islands, um, higher nest success with a 
increasing vegetation density and a actually negative correlation with uh, vegetation height. So to a certain point, vegetation height can inhibit um, you know, nest success. And we had higher nest success in year two and then a small uh, positive effect of nest initiation. So as, as the season progressed, uh, there were more successful nests. So some of our depredations, and you have some, some cool pictures here represented uh, yeah, of, of the suite of species that you know we, we attributed to depredations. Uh, raccoons composed 18, uh, 18 of our depredations. Crows, uh, they contribute about seven. Mink, two. Bald eagle, one. So we got him on camera, luckily, because uh, you know we hadn't really thought that that was going to be a nest predator, but you know, lo and behold, here it is. Um, imported red fire ants. So this happened when the you know the eggs were kind of starting to hatch, um, and you know there are fire ants around, and they caused the you know the really they 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 killed the the ducklings. So you know it's kind of gruesome to see that, but you know otherwise we had four unknown that we didn't have uh, trail cameras on and couldn't identify the the nest predator, and we had partial and attempted depredations by rat snakes. As you see this guy up here, he's trying really hard, but the the egg is just a little bit too big for him. Um, also corn snakes and minks. So flooding actually, uh, you know, we had four, uh, four of our nests that uh, failed were due to flooding. And this is a picture of a hen just trying to re, you know, recollect everything, all, all our nest materials and rebuild uh, prior to a flood. Um, so in comparison to, uh, you know, the, the Chesapeake Bay, which their rate for, uh, you know, flooding induced failures was around 4%, ours was around 7 So for the, uh, for our nest site selection, we found that, uh, you know, there was a significant difference in grass composition and use versus non-use site, sites, meaning that, um, you know, the, there was a higher composition of grass at the nest versus not at the nest. Uh, vegetation height, you know, to a certain extent, um, it was higher at the nest. Uh, vegetation density was higher at the nest, and we didn't find any uh, significance in these other two factors. So uh, the discussion here, uh, nest initiation for black ducks peaks in early April, and this was right when North Carolina is conducting their helicopter surveys. Uh, so similar to other studies, uh, depredation are the leading is the leading cause of nest failure. Um, finally, although there there were a few other factors that we identified as having effects on nest success, nest location, and vegetation density were the biggest factors in nest nest success. So you know, resulting from that, uh, we, we were able to say that uh, nest success is higher on islands. This is the population genomics portion of my presentation. So a little backstory, you know, like I mentioned, we do have mallards, uh, you know, using the same breeding areas as as black ducks. So therefore, where they they coexist, they often hybridize. Um, so this is kind of a backstory of how mallards uh, got on the Atlantic Flyway. So before the 1950s, mallards were rare, um, you know, vagrants east of the Mississippi River. But after the after the 50s, mallards expanded, uh, and this was due to, to large large landscape changes uh, in eastern Canada. A lot of this was uh, deforestation, and they were able to come over uh, to the Atlantic Flyway. So, kind of going on at the at the same time, uh, we had a large scale release of game farm mallards, and these are mallards released, um, you know, on regulated shooting areas. Uh, for for you know sport hunting and training dogs, so from the 20s to the 60s, uh, we had about 500,000 game farm mallards released per year by the state, and then from the 1960s to now, the large scale state releases have stopped, but um, the regulated shooting areas continue to release around 200,000 game farm mallards a year. Um, so. Some definitions before we kind of get, get into this hybridization topic. Um, so hybridization uh, for you, you that might not be familiar is just when two species cross to produce a viable offspring. Uh, so intergression, this is when those resulting hybrids, um, you know, breed back to the parental population. So in this case, that would be the, the mallard or the black duck. So a hybrid breeding with the mallard is called intergression. 
So the hybrid swarm, this results, um, you know, when you just pretty much have hybrids on the landscape, um, you know, you don't have any clear uh, parental populations anymore. Your, your wild mallard, your wild black ducks, um, they're not pure anymore. So that, that, that's what we see with this hybrid swarm, that they don't, they're essentially extinct on the landscape. And this has occurred uh, specifically with uh, the, the Hawaiian duck on the Hawaiian islands, you know, where game farm mallards were introduced. Now you don't have any pure Hawaiian ducks, so they're uh, genetically extinct there. Uh, so game farm mallards, uh, these are mallards of European descent denoted by what's, in, what's called an old world A haplotype, and we find this um, by looking at the mitochondrial DNA. Um, so again, we're able to identify these uh, because they have that haplotype, and it's, it's very easy to tell where they came from. Um, so these were bred for sport shooting and re retriever training, as I mentioned. And then we have our wild mallards. These are the birds that you know came over from the the western United States uh, following the land use changes. And there are you know there are wild mallards in the Atlantic Flyway, and we you know we are able to identify these with what's called the New World B haplotype. Um, so again, the the B haplotype is really something that uh, originated in in North America whereas the A that came from uh, Europe. So kind of to, to give you an idea here of, um, you know, a visual idea of, of what's going on in hybridization. So obviously the first one, as I mentioned before, we have a black duck breeding with a mallard. Result is a F1 hybrid, uh, mallard black duck. So integration down here, this next part is when this hybrid breeds back to one of the parental populations. In this case, this is the black duck, and your result is an F2 hybrid. Um, and this is integration because the, the genes from the mallard are now, you know, within that black duck genome. So the hybrid swarm, this is when your your uh, just random filial generations of hybrids are breeding together and there are no pure parentals on the population. So some of the concerns we have uh, with, with hybridization and specifically with game farm mallards, um, you know, is genetic adaptability uh, for American black ducks. Uh, so th the game farm mallards, they have a lot lower genetic diversity, and that's mainly from years of, of line breeding. So we, we, you know, we've essentially bred a lot of that variation out. So when you have that you know, the, the captive reared or the game farm mallard breeding back into a wild population, you're going to eventually have re reduced, um, you know, genetic adaptability. Um, and as I mentioned, we, we're always worried about this hybrid swarm, which, like I mentioned earlier, has occurred uh, with the Hawaiian duck. Um, and then finally, reduced breeding potential. This, uh, this study in 2004 found that hybrids produce about 14% fewer females, which 14% fewer females that can breed and add to the population. So our field methods from the, the nest that we uh, monitored, we collected uh, eggshell membranes and also uh, maternal contour feather, uh, contour feathers from the nesting hen. Um, so we were able to, to extract DNA uh, from those uh, using uh, what's called the uh, DDRADSeq was is how we sequenced all that uh, DNA that we extracted. Um, so we had two different types of DNA we were looking at: nuclear DNA, um, and from this we got our nuclear nucleotide diversity and our differentiation estimates. Um, and then second, the mitochondrial DNA. This is how we were able to identify the old world A versus the new world B haplotypes and construct a haplotype network. So we compared our 40 samples um, to 199 uh, genetically vetted mallards, black ducks, and hybrids from uh, Phil Lavretsky's database, uh, and we used what's called admixture, uh, you know, to to kind of assess the population structure. Uh, essentially, this is pretty much the 23andMe for wildlife, um, if you guys are familiar with that. Uh, so you know. By itself, admixture was could tell us a lot, but we wanted to make our study more robust. So we added uh, another analysis method, fine rad structure, and uh, secondly, print a principal component analysis. And finally, we wanted to look at um, you know parentage and sibling or sibship uh, in the program colony. 
So here's the 23 and me. Um, so as you can see, so the K here, this is the genetic contributors. So in each of these boxes, we have different colors. Um, these colors represent your contributors. So for this one, the red you see is captive reared mallards. Um, the green is wild mallards and the yellow is a unique um, nuclear assignment we found uh, that was really attributed to highly related black ducks. Uh, additionally, the black here, this is uh, wild black ducks or continental black ducks that we had from our reference sample. So as mentioned, this K, uh, you know, will tell you what percentage um, of, of, you know, of, of contributors um, the really the, the lineage uh, re resulted in. Uh, so you have in this case for captive reared mallards, you know, mostly over 90% uh, composed of that captive reared mallard uh, genetic material, and then a small portion of uh, mallards and related individuals. Uh, so this was, you know, the first four boxes. This was our, our, our baseline data from our genetically vetted uh, samples. And this is our results uh, from our North Carolina samples, our 40 samples we had here. So, um, and you can see how each of these uh, have the genetic contributors, um, you know, arranged in them. So for our uh, wild black ducks or continental black ducks that we are assigned. So this is the first one, unrelated black duck from North Carolina. That means that, you know, it's more similar to this continental population of black ducks. Um, that's our first genetic class we have. Second, these are related black ducks. So we are act actually able to pick out, um, you know, a unique uh, genetic class here that was assigned based on how closely they were related. Um, you know, and you see this yellow kind of uh, going through the rest of the boxes as well. That, you know, that kind of lends itself to uh, what we hypothesized, you know, was going on with this population was that they're, you know, pretty endemic to coastal North Carolina and they don't really move around much. They breed in the same area and you have those, you know, uh, that lineage uh, continue in, in coastal North Carolina, and you don't really have much going outside of that. Uh, so the third one here, we have second cousin black ducks. So this is, they had, you know, a considerably high level of, of relationship, but, um, you know, they also had the con contributions here from um, your continental black ducks as well. So this is likely the result of, uh, of a new black duck from another uh, part of the flyway coming in and breeding to a, a hen that was, you know, endemic to uh, coastal North Carolina. Uh, so uh, fourth here, we have the mallard black duck hybrids. So this is largely comp composed of, of mallard DNA and black duck DNA. And then finally, we had um, the feral mallard or captive reared mallard and um, black duck hybrids. So, um, you know, this was very interesting that we, we came up with this and, you know, is, is some cause for concern. So in our fine rad structure, we were able to pull out these same four classes, uh, North Carolina uh, the, and the continental black ducks here, the wild mallards and the captive reared mallards. And we found that, um, you know, the fine rad structure showed that the highest level of co-ancestry occurred with our North Carolina samples, which you know, makes sense based on what we saw with our 23andMe, you know, that there's a lot of highly related individuals down there. And so that was repeated in this, um, you know, in, in the results of this analysis. So for our principal component analysis, um, so we saw that there were three primary groups uh, consisting of our, rep, our, our reference, captive reared mallards, wild mallards, and American black ducks. So these are the captive reared mallards. Uh, the green here is the wild mallards, the black is the American black ducks. Um, and we found that our samples were largely scattered around within and around these groups, um, uh, among, sorry. Uh, so, you know, finally looking at the, um, the both the, the fine rad structure and PCA, uh, we were able to identify two sets of full siblings. So that's what you see here, these guys clustering, you know, off from the, the main group here. You know, these were highly related individuals and they, they, they found their own group. Uh, so for, for hybridization, we found that, you know, there are around 55% of the black ducks breeding in North Carolina or, um, you know, are pure. Um, we found a, a level of 45% for our, our mallard black duck hybrids. 
Um, so first generation hybrids compose 25%, second generation 15%, and third generation 5%. Uh, concerning again was this game farm mallard uh, contributions. We found this within 22.5% of our samples. So for uh, this first uh, figure here, this is the differentiation estimates. So this is how dissimilar, um, you know, each of the, the genotypes are from you know, these these different categories. So as you go up the Y axis, you know, you have higher levels of differentiation. Uh, so the main takeaways from this, um, so there's we found high differentiation from game farm mallards and wild mallards, black ducks and hybrids. Uh, we found low differentiation between black ducks, mallards and hybrids. Um, so they were, you know, pretty similar. And then finally, we found an intermediate differentiation between uh, our reference black duck mallard and samples, uh, reference black duck and mallard samples to our North Carolina related black ducks. Uh, you know, again, that's just kind of um, evidence of, you know, they're, they're, they've been breeding in this area for a long period of time and they have, you know, their kind of their own unique thing going on. Um, so it's different from the rest of the, po of the continental population. So with our uh, nucleotide diversity, you know, we found that although we had, uh, you know, influence of uh, highly related individuals breeding back together, we would have ex expected to see lower genetic diversity. Um, you know, but we believe that, at least from what we saw, that the, you know, the, the level of genetic diversity was, was maintained here uh, in our samples. And we believe that the cause of that is because we do have black ducks coming in from, you know, other parts of the flyway bringing in new, new genetic material. Um, and, you know, interesting to note, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the game farm mallard nucleotide diversity is super low compared to all these others. So, you know, that was a, a cause for concern that we might see results here or, you know, the result being that we had, um, you know, lower genetic diversity in our uh, game farm mallard and black duck hybrids, which actually was not the case at this point. So the results of our, um, our mitochondrial DNA analysis, we were able to identify this old world haplogroup and we had a few um, of our North Carolina samples that were uh, part of this group. Now, so it's important to note that the mitochondrial DNA is, is inherited from the mother. So we're able to look back uh, you know, at, a, at a larger spatial scale, uh, to, sorry, temporal scale and you know, kind of get an idea of, of you know, ancestry. So at some point in time, um, you know, fr from what we're seeing here with these two samples, you know, there was a captive reared or, um, you know, Eur Eurasian mallard that bred with a wild population of, of mallards or black ducks. And, you know, you have that a haplotype that, that persisted. So with our, our new world B, so these are the wild birds in North Carolina. Um, you know, we had a unique uh, offset here uh, and cluster for our samples. So that, that, again, that just drives the point home that these birds have been breeding in North Carolina for a long period of time and have, you know, have their own, um, you know, signatures. So, um, you know, for our, our SIBship and uh, a parentage uh, analysis through program colony, we found that 75% of our samples were related. Um, we came back with 32 parentage assignments, five full SIB pairings and 38 half sib pairings. So that that's just saying that, yeah, we have a lot of related individuals here. Uh, so we were able to identify evidence of colonial nesting and this uh, translated is, uh, you know, we identified eight sister pairs nesting close in time and space. So here's a, um, you know, here's an example here. These were all uh, siblings nesting on the same island, pretty much on the same side of the island uh, at similar times. Actually, you know, within the same time period here, as you see by what I have them labeled as 10, so 107, we found this one first, 108, 109. Um, so they they initiated nests right around the same time. Uh, so that was, you know, kind of evidence of, of uh, natal phylopatry, which is, this is, um, you know, the, the more or less for, for the ducks that, you know, were, were raised here, um, you know, they have, um, they, they will come back. So, and we, we found that, um, you know, that with, with these especially, 
And then, you know, breeding phyllopatry, this is just the fact that the hens will return to their same nesting grounds they nested in the year before. So this was a re-nest we observed. So on the landscape, you know, we do have in coastal North Carolina, we do have RSAs, RSAs releasing game farm mallards. So we wanted to plot that, you know, where they're releasing and the, the amount of birds they're releasing in relation to, you know, where, where we came up with our genetic contributions from game farm mallards. And, you know, it wasn't really, um, you know, conclusive evidence that, you know, we had samples uh, close to these centers. Uh, but, you know, for this one especially, you know, we had, there's game farm mallards being released here. And, you know, within that same kind of area, we had, uh, we were able to identify uh, a few samples that had those genetic uh, contributions. So finally, um, we found that our, our hybridization level in North Carolina was around 47 and a half percent compared to the rest of the flyway, which is about 42 percent. It seems to be a little bit higher. Um, we do have game farm mallards that are established uh, in a feral population in North Carolina, and that's mainly from, you know, prolonged releases. Um, so we have landscape level gene flow occurring from game farm mallards to black ducks. And like I mentioned, you know, that's 22 and a half percent of our samples. You know, we found that contribution in there. Uh, so nucleotide diversity, you know, despite, uh, you know, potentially being highly related, uh, they match reference levels, so we're not really too worried about inbreeding at this point. Uh, additionally, North Carolina breeding black ducks were highly related uh, with the parent natal and breeding phyllopatry. Uh, as long as there's a source, you know, for, for these game farm mallards, you know, there will be genetic integration. And, you know, we, we believe that what we uh, witnessed was a direct, uh, you know, a direct cause of how many uh, game farm mallards were being released at that time. You know, so I imagine if, if uh, you know, they stopped, if they stopped releasing game farm mallards, you know, we wouldn't have uh, these genetic assignments come back in the future. And we could, you know, potentially get back to our pure mallard and black duck populations. Uh, so, you know, over time, though, if, if it continues, if the releases continue, um, you know, genet genetic diversity will be reduced um, in, in the black duck population and that will decrease the effective population size. Um, you know, so that's a big concern, um, you know, and, and definitely, you know, cause to, to do more research on this topic. So I'd like to acknowledge the uh, North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, uh, University of Delaware, University of Texas, El Paso, uh, the National Wildlife Refuges where I conducted my research and my technicians that I had over the years. So finally, we'll take any questions. And at the bottom left, you'll see these are the publications uh, that came from our research. And feel free to, to look at look in, look into those if you want to know more about it. Thank you, guys. So, uh, so, uh, so, th so th thanks, Doug, thanks, and, Doug Daniel. and Daniel. That was a great was presentation. Great. A lot of really lot good, of really work, good work, work with direct, direct application, application to, to what our agency, what our agency does. does. Um, if anybody uh, if has any uh, questions, if you will, just put them in the chat. Um, and we'll start out. We've got just about five minutes or so for questions. Um, we'll start off, Doug, with you considering the history of Curry Tuck Sound from a wetlands and waterfowl perspective. Why is the sound not good black duck nesting habitat? And this relates back to your map you showed where y'all really focused in on where you thought the best habitat was. Right. <clears throat> and that became apparent to me uh, not long after we began surveying. Uh, I thought Currituck would have been a good black duck nesting area as well, but it, it appears in, in Currituck Sound, you know, you've either got uh, monotypic black needle rush marsh, or you've got monotypic Spartina alternate flora marsh. And as Daniel mentioned, we don't see that nice mixture of uh, salt marsh cord grass. Uh, Spartina alternate floor and black needle rush. There's not a lot of grass composition there, and, and also it's a fairly low area. So it, it, most of that's considered low marsh. So really, it, it comes down to just availability of good nesting habitat. It just doesn't occur there north north of Roanoke Island to any great extent. So I think that was reflected in our, you know, low numbers of observations, uh, you know, in the Curry Tuck Sound area. So you know, can't change hydrology. 
Well, or at least not easily. <laughs> it's certainly not on the all of the Curry Tuck Sound. Um, if anybody else has got any questions, put them in the chat. I'll follow up with another one. Um, I'm going to sort of put you on the spot, Daniel, and maybe give Doug a break on this one. Uh, he'll smile when he hears the, the question. Um, he may have told you some of the history of our wildlife management division and our agency's involvement in captive mallard releases. So based on your genetic research, uh, if, if our commission, our policy board, ask your opinion uh, as to captive mallard releases relative to the long-term future of black ducks as a priority species, as Doug pointed out in the Wildlife Action Plan, it's a priority species for Atlantic Coat Joint Venture. What would your recommendation to the commission be? Um, it would be to, you know, limit free flight releases for sure. Um, you know, just because, like like I mentioned in my presentation there, we did see uh, the contributions of those releases uh, in the wild populations. So that means that they're not limited to where they're being released at. Um, you know, they're mixing in with our wild uh, mallards and black ducks, um, which over time, you know, not, we didn't observe it at this point, but over time, you know, the concerns that we had were, you know, that could result in less adaptability of the American black duck and wild mallard, especially in North Carolina. So, yeah. All right, very good. Um, I don't see any more questions. I will just again thank both y'all not only for the work, um, but also for the very great presentation. Um, I will say, Daniel and, and Doug, maybe we can talk about in the future uh, coming back and doing some more discussion about the sea level rise part of the work. Uh, I think that not only is obviously very relevant, but I think it's something that would be of, of high interest to to our folks in the agency and also to the public so maybe we can talk about that in a little later but um, thanks again for the presentation and thanks everybody for uh, for logging in and uh, and hope you have a good rest of your day well, thank you guys appreciate you having me yeah thanks everyone